Today on the Lowdown, a dance season podcast, Japa Fiddle give us the lowdown on executive functioning in people with Down syndrome. Over to you, Hannah Mala. Thanks, Danielle. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lowdown Podcast. My name is Hina Mehmood. I am an occupational therapist at the Down Syndrome Resource Foundation. And joining me is my wonderful co-host, Marla Folden, who is an SLP at the DSRF. Hi, Marla. Hello, Hina. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Great. Outside today. I know it is a really nice Vancouver pre-fall day. So Perfect. my favorite season is upon us. I'm very excited. <laughs> yeah. Enough with the heat. Um, so before we continue on with our episode, we would love for you to hit that subscribe button and leave a review of our podcast on your chosen podcast platform. Also remember to check out our episode pages for additional resources related to each episode. You can also follow the DSRF um, on Facebook at the Down Syndrome Resource Foundation, um, or on Twitter and Instagram uh, by following at DSRF Canada. So on this episode, we will be focusing on a really important concept that impacts how we live our day-to-day -day lives. On any given day, we use so many different parts of our brain to, you know, complete our daily activities, whether it's planning what we're going to wear to work in the morning, remembering our many to-do lists, paying attention during a meeting, or even managing our emotions when we are frustrated with a colleague or a client. All of these brain processes need to work together in order for us to really accomplish important tasks. These processes, also known as executive functioning, are a crucial component for learning and development. And we're really excited for our guest today um, because she's going to be helping us highlight how executive functioning can impact individuals with Down syndrome. During the discussion, we will talk uh, about things that come up daily in our practices. Uh, this includes impulsivity, attention issues, memory, and of course, emotional regulation. So we would love to welcome Dr. Deborah Fiddler to the lowdown. Hi, Dr. Fiddler. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yes. Thanks for joining us. Very excited to have you. Yeah, we are. Um, Dr. Fiddler is a PhD and professor at Colorado State University in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. She's earned her PhD in Psychological Studies and Education from UCLA in 2001. And her research expertise is in the area of child development with a focus on emerging developmental profiles in Down syndrome during early childhood. Dr. Fiddler served as editor of the American Journal on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities from 2014 to 2018, and has served as co-editor of the International Review of Research in Developmental Disabilities since 2014. She's published more than 80 articles and chapters on development in individuals with Down syndrome and other neuro neurodevelopmental conditions as well. And her most recent work has been focused on translating developmental science into new educational and intervention approaches to support well-being in individuals with DS and their families throughout the lifespan. So this is really important and essential work, and we're so delighted to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, in the sort of tradition that we do here at The Lowdown, we usually start with five secret questions, we call them secret, um, that are not related to our regular topic, that are kind of icebreaker type questions so that our listeners get to know you a little bit. Are you okay with that? That sounds wonderful. All right. First question is, what, would, what are you most looking forward to doing post-COVID? I am looking forward to getting my whole family together. We are um, dispersed all across the U.S. and mm. we, um, we were lucky enough right before COVID really hit to have celebrated um, my mother's 75th birthday all together. And um, it was, you know, a wonderful, joyful family celebration. Uh, but we all miss being together. And so um, family in the Chicago area and the DC area, and I'm out here in Colorado, and we just all want to see each other. Yeah. Yeah. Family reunion time. I can't wait either. It's going to be so yeah. lovely. For sure. Um, second question is what should somebody do if they're going to visit Colorado? What's the number one thing they should see or do? 
the number one thing to do in Colorado is to be outside (laughs) and to look around you um, wherever you are. There are vistas in um, almost every direction. And um, I'm lucky enough to have been living on the front range of northern Colorado for about 20 years now. lucky enough to get this uh, position at Colorado State um, a while back. And it's given me the chance to um, explore so many different beautiful um, uh, parts of the state um, and to not just live in the foothills, but to head up to the canyons on weekends and um, uh get to be in, in beautiful rivers and, um, mm. and on beautiful vistas from nice long hikes. And so that's really, that's what we have, um, you know, in, in our pockets as, as a really special um, attraction for Colorado. Yeah, it is gorgeous. I had the pleasure of visiting this summer for the first time. My sister lives in Colorado and I was astounded just and such diverse mountain ranges too. I mean, mm. yeah, it was lovely. So I would, I would follow up with that for sure. Yeah. But I have to say Vancouver's not too bad either. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's pretty competitive in terms of uh, how incredible the vistas are there too. Yeah. 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 We I think all that rights. Yeah. All that rights would feel very comfortable going to Colorado because it's just like a really, yeah. Awesome. Um, okay. I'm going to take over for the next few questions. So question number three, what are you currently reading or listening to? So books, audiobooks, podcasts. Well, um, I have, uh, an eclectic kind of, um, set of tastes, but actually right now with my son, who is in eighth grade, um, we are, um, we're reading the um, teenage adaptation of the seven habits of highly effective oh, teens. Yeah. And so we're learning about some principles we've just started together. And, um, you know, he um, has some wonderful foundations. And we know that adolescence is a time when there's all kinds of identity formation and development happening. And so, um, you know, what could be more fun than like a reading club with mom? (laughs) Hey, you know, I didn't know there was a teen adaptation of that book, but you're you're tempting me and my kids are toddlers. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> prepare. I might have to put that one on the shelf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the idea though of reading a book together with your mom. I think that's kind of cool. And it is something that you can, you could discuss together and talk about. So that's a very cool idea. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So question number four, what is your ideal way to spend a sunny weekend? Where would we find you? Gosh. Um, well, I'll talk about the weekend that we're hoping to have. So um, we um, are planning, you know, and the best plans, you know, we want to never um, get too sure about them, but we're planning to be able to um, go to the first football game, American mm-hmm. football game, mm-hmm. um, uh, at Colorado State University that's been open to fans, even with social distancing um, this coming weekend. And just even sporting events that all our family used to love um, to just be in the roaring crowds and going to Rockies games, in particular Colorado Rockies um, baseball games. And so this will be the first um, attempt making sure that, you know, we really feel comfortable with all the safety measures, but so far so good um, to just cheer on the Colorado State University football team um, this coming weekend. And then, um, you know, I think we, we also like some downtime too. It's pretty gotten back into the school schedule and already you know, I think we could use a little bit of a, a breather. Um, yeah. And so um, taking some time to do um, 
we like to do little escape room, home escape rooms. You know, you can buy oh. little kits. Yeah. And so we, a couple weekends ago, we did one. It was hard, um, yeah. but we made it through. We used some hints. We yeah. gave you some hints. <laughs> um, I'm not saying we did it without help, but we, <laughs> but we got through to the other side. So, um, you know, those kinds of fun board games and um, sometimes even some video games together. Um, I'm not very good at any of them, but I try to stay current. <laughs> yeah. that's so cool I didn't know they had at home escape room kits I that's so much fun and I totally I don't think I've ever done an escape room without hints so yeah <laughs> it's not it's, it's not built to do it without hints so <laughs> I could totally get that uh, awesome okay so our last question what is your favorite album of all time something you could put on repeat and never get tired of Oh my goodness. Um, well, so this one is, that has a little bit of emotion for me right now because my absolute all time favorite singer songwriter, um, just passed away. Um, her name is Nancy Griffith. And, um, I listened to her all the way from back when I was in, when I was a teenager, my son's age, I started listening to her, um, 13, 14 years old. Um, she had an album called other voices, other rooms that was all cover, um, songs that I, adored and I had it as a cassette tape and I listened mm -hmm. to it until you couldn't even hear anything. Uh, it was worn so thin. Um, yeah. and so, um, you know, hands down, um, that, uh, her music is, goes right to my heart. Amazing. Very cool. All right. Um, well, thank you for indulging us in that. That was really fun, um, to, mm -hmm. to get to know, uh, to get to know you a little bit better. And I'm sure our listeners enjoyed that as well. So let's kind of dive into our topic. Um, before, can you just tell us a little bit about how you got involved working with individuals with Down syndrome? Sure. Um, so I was really lucky growing up. I got to go to a summer program each summer, an overnight camp um, that was an inclusive camp that had um, children of lots of different abilities living side by side in a community setting where a lot of our activities were shared Um playing sports, uh, arts and crafts, swimming, um, children with different neurodevelopmental conditions alongside typical peers. And it was an incredibly formative experience for me. And um, some of the friends that I made growing up in that program had Down syndrome, and some of them I'm still in touch with today. Um, and they've been really important relationships in my lives, uh, in my life. Um, so um, I, I would say that when it became time for me to start to think about a career path in my late teen years and my early adulthood, um, it really, um, there was a long lasting impression that was made. And um, I, I knew I would be motivated to try to um, find a path towards creating that kind of community, not just in a summer camp and not just maybe even in an inclusive classroom, but mm -hmm. how can we make um, all members of our community um, be valued and be welcome and um, self-determined and um, uh, a little bit of a, a sense of that kind of everybody all together spirit that we had um, in that camp experience. Very cool. I've had a, bit, a lot of people that I've talked to who work with individuals with Down syndrome have a similar experience where they, whether it's at school or a camp and it's just, you know, it's just like, it's just that spark that you get Im immediately. And you're like, yeah, it's in your blood. That's what <laughs> happened with me when I started working at DSRF at the front desk, it was in my blood. I'm like, I'm coming back. So, so I could imagine that for sure. Very cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about executive functioning. Can you, for our listeners, kind of begin by defining what executive functioning is? And maybe let's talk a little bit about some of the components of executive functioning. Absolutely. Well, you did a great job um, setting the stage in the introduction. And um, if I go to the sort of um, the scientific definition um, framework, um, the executive function term is um, used as an overarching term to refer to the thinking skills that we use whenever we are trying to um, uh, set goals for ourselves and reach them, whenever we're trying to behave in ways that are purposeful and organized, whenever we're trying to solve a problem. And um, uh, there's been a literature that has grown over the past 
20 or 30 years on how important these thinking skills are, how related they are to so many different aspects of our lives. So um, executive function skills have been linked to academic performance in the transition to kindergarten throughout primary grades. It's been linked to um, uh, employment in adulthood, um, health promoting behaviors in adolescence. Um, so this is a construct that um, has really been important and useful for us when we think about supporting positive outcomes for people um, from a developmental perspective, which is the perspective I always come from. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting about executive function is, is that even though there is this really growing literature about how important it is, there's still some ongoing conversations that researchers are, are having together about what it's made out of and, mm -hmm. um, you know, what the sort of architecture of executive function is. And mm -hmm. um, there's one framework that talks about executive function as sort of um, one um thinking skill, one thought process that gets tapped into all at once. Um, and there is another framework that sees executive function as being made up of a couple of uh, important components that are related to each other and that work together, but that can be separated from one another. And that second, what we call the dissociable model, that second separate um, different components model mm -hmm. is the model that most researchers who study executive function and Down syndrome have been working with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about you know, are we born with our determinant amount of executive functioning or mm -hmm. are these skills that we develop as we grow older? You know, you were talked a little bit about entry to kindergarten. Does somebody have their complete executive functioning skill set ready to go by kindergarten age? So the uh, development of executive function really unfolds uh, throughout the first three to five years of life. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll come back to it in just a second, but one of the things that we've been very interested in our research team is um, being able to trace some of the very early precursors to executive function mm -hmm. that are detectable even in infancy and in toddlerhood. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the sort of general literature on executive function, um, it's really not until ages sort of three to five where um, we have a real sense of how to measure executive function in reliable ways and um, where that construct is really understood to be um, uh, really present in, um, in its traditional sense. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of in the in the general population, um, uh, there's a real clear progression between age the ages of three, three and a half, until the ages of five and five and a half, where um, children are acquiring different aspects of executive function and mastering different um, executive function skills, um, kind of in, in similar progressions and um, uh, sort of uh, in a, a, a similar path. Mm -hmm. um, but what we also see is that um, there was a lot of work going on to get to that three to five year old pathway, a lot of important foundations underneath. And so um, our team is in the camp of believing that we are starting to build the earliest foundations of executive function skills um, throughout the earliest years of life. Um, and that there are our factors, um, researchers are starting to talk about something called regulatory function in, in mm -hmm. infants. Mm -hmm. um, and one of um, the one of my colleagues now, a former student of mine who um, is now um, uh, a postdoctoral fellow at Cincinnati Children's um, Medical Hospital campus, um, Dr. Emily Schwar, um, has um, focused on trying to understand precursors and has shown a link between these sort of early regulatory functions in infancy and the acquisition of some important um, social and communication milestones in the toddler years. Um, and she's also shown some really important early subtle detectable um, features of development in, um, in general in infants with Down syndrome that may set the stage for um, mm. greater competence or greater challenge in um, the acquisition of executive function skills. Mm -hmm. 
you mentioned about the research of the early precursors of executive functioning in infancy, and you mentioned kind of a little bit about our, our individuals with Down syndrome. Can you provide our listeners um, with the overall profile of executive functioning um, for individuals with Down syndrome and the strengths and challenges? Because Marla and I see in our sessions where there's some you know differences, but we would love to hear from your perspective what the overall profile is. Absolutely. So I'm going to share with you um, what we know um, from the research um, on the group level. And um, there's been a lot of research that's been done over the past 15, 20 years or so, trying to answer questions about what are some patterns of strength and um, vulnerability related to executive function um, for groups of um, participants with Down syndrome in research studies, when compared, for example, to children at similar developmental levels um, who are younger but typically developing, mm -hmm. or when compared to other children with different neurodevelopmental conditions who do not have Down syndrome. So there's, um, there's a clear pattern that we can report on. But before I talk about that, I want to say that um, we think that there are um, additional important questions to be answered, and our team is working to try to answer them starting now um, about some of the ways that people with Down syndrome may differ from one another and whether or mm -hmm. not there are some subgroups mm -hmm. of people with Down syndrome who grow with um, patterns that look sort of a little bit different from one another. And so I want to give the caveat um, to the answer about the group level by saying that we believe that there are some important um, differences among people with Down syndrome and that what I'm about to describe doesn't apply to every person um, with Down syndrome that we will study or that yeah. we will work with or have in our families um, or in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. So um, the pattern that we see more broadly um, involves some very um, uh, clear challenges among many people in the remembering components of executive function and um, the what's called working memory. And so um, working memory is the um, set of memory skills that we use when we're trying to complete a task and we are holding on to what our goal is. And we're also sort of updating ourselves about where we are in the sequence of um, the strategy that you're trying to use to reach the goal. There's this updating component of working memory is very important. Um, and um, across many different studies, whether it's looking at working memory in the laboratory, using laboratory tasks and carefully controlled kind of um, study designs, or whether we're asking um, for caregivers or for teachers or for clinicians to evaluate executive function skills um, using different kinds of measures, standardized measures um, across all of those different kinds of studies, we very frequently see um, elevated risk for challenge in working memory. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's an interesting finding that just came out from a sort of um, uh, analysis of all of the studies that have been produced yep. called a meta-analysis um, that suggests that there's a bigger um, effect for challenges in working memory that involves auditory information. So mm -hmm. verbal information coming in through our ears, um, that that is even more of a challenge um, for um, um, many people with Down syndrome than the working memory that we use when we're taking in visual information. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a pattern that many people yeah. have reported, not just in working memory. Yeah, absolutely. And it kind of plays into what we recommend really often is to provide visual supports to our students because we know that auditory processing is a challenge and this mm -hmm. is a sort of a different lens onto the same piece of information and a yeah. bit of an explanation as to why it's such a challenge so yeah and then very interesting and a good example for our listeners that may not be familiar with working memory and how it works is like for, if you give a child or a student a list of instructions like hey can you go get your backpack and then I want you to go pick up your shoes and then meet me at the door and then we'll go to the car so there's a lot of information for them to hold all at once and what ends up happening is that they will just go 
meet you at the car, but forget all the things that come before that. So, mm -hmm. so definitely like it, then if you use visual supports and outline all those steps visually, then it is higher chance of success of them doing all those steps and then meeting you at the car. Am I correct, Dr. Mm -hmm. Fiddler? Is that, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, and um, so some of the um, questions that we ask ourselves um, when we're thinking about how to apply this information um, to help families, to help um, children, to help students um, in learning context, we um, think about both the strategies that you described that help sort of um, relieve some of or alleviate some of the, um, the working memory load that mm -hmm. um, different tasks may involve. Mm -hmm. um, but we also think about what are the kinds of ways that we can practice um, holding on to information in our day-to-day -day lives so that we can see if we can um, get a little bit better at it, you know, week by week um, and develop skills that um, strengthen that and, and really practice that particular skill set too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So apart from working memory, um, are there any other areas of executive functioning that are, that prove to be a challenge for individuals with Jones Day? Yes. So, and um, and the findings I'm I'm describing now are also really focused on the childhood literature. So we can mm -hmm. talk a little bit later about adolescence and adulthood and what's different and what's similar. Um, but um, working memory uh, and uh, and in addition to a slightly lesser extent, there's um, uh, risk for challenges in the planning aspects of executive function. So the ability mm -hmm. to um, sequence our behavior um, in these sort of orderly ways and um, that help us get to a goal. Um, like if I'm making a sandwich, knowing that um, in order to get started, I first the first step I need to take is to get all my ingredients out. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be a couple of steps in the middle where I'm putting things on plates and I'm getting utensils and I'm spreading peanut butter and jelly. Um, and then knowing that the ultimate kind of goal is that last step of putting the bread together um, and taking a bite and maybe a couple of other steps of putting everything away and getting out a napkin or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the planning component of executive function, especially in childhood, um, looks like it also is um, difficult for many children and that practice with sort of initiating strategies and then mm -hmm. chaining behaviors together um, in a sequence in order to reach a goal can be an, uh, an area that um, uh, children can um, really benefit from supports with. Mm -hmm. So to kind of illustrate using your example, that might look like then I want to make a sandwich, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure how to start this process. So I might just stand there and look around until I get further prompting from a, an adult or a helper, mm -hmm. or maybe I, everything is out, but then what goes, what goes next in sort of the, the steps. And so, you know, we don't want to eat an empty piece of bread sandwich, but sort of getting started with things seems to be a challenge. Exactly. Right? Um, that um, initiation, that getting started piece um, is something that we talk to a lot of families about. And, um, you know, uh, there's an interesting um, finding that we had in one of our studies where we asked um, five to 10 year olds with Down syndrome to um, just take a little play break and play with some of these objects that we had in our little toy bin that were objects that didn't have like a very clear exact way to play with them. So it wasn't like there was a doll and a hairbrush or something like that. Um, there were some neat little shapes and some coins and some um, things that twisted around and some puff balls and things like that. And um, we, um, we analyzed the different creative things that kids um, in the study did that they came up with for how to play with these objects. And many children came up with some really neat things to do. Um, but we also saw a bit more of sort of um, just kind of taking the objects and holding them for a little bit of, of time yeah. before they got started. Mm -hmm. And that sort of holding behavior um, that suggested that there was an intent to be playing with the objects and a desire to be playing with the objects and that there was sort of 
one ingredient that was needed around sort of getting started and initiating. Um, and then um, we would see subsequently um, different kinds of new play acts that mm-hmm. kids would do. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think one of the, uh, one of the number one things parents and teachers will seek our help about is that task initiation that just getting started can be a, can be really tricky. Mm-hmm. Another component that I would love to hear your thoughts on, um, that we, we see our, our individuals with Down syndrome have challenges with, um, is impulsivity <laughs> and like that and the connection. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause that it's really, it's, astounding as to how much it is a challenge for mm. parents at home and for teachers. And, and it's, I, I find that if our listeners can really understand where that is coming from and what's behind it, it can help in not only understanding and being patient about it, but then coming up with the strategies. Mm-hmm. It's great. I, I feel like oh, that please. area, oh, it's okay. I feel like that area almost more than any other results mm-hmm. in limited participation for yeah. our students because their behavior gets coined as naughty or bad or whatever, and then they're not allowed to participate. So it's an area that puts families under a lot of stress, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. This is a really important topic. And I'll sort of start with um, that kind of difference between the group level and the individual level um, uh, idea that we were talking about that um, we do see across studies that there is a... um, a subgroup of participants um, who tend to show um, elevated risk for difficulty with a different part of executive function. Um, that's the sort of holding back part of executive function called inhibition or inhibitory control. And um, inhibition is um, really important for just like being having a, a plan and being able to remember where you are with a task. Um, inhibition actually is really important for being able to reach goals and complete tasks as well. Um, and it's for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, it um, helps us sort of resist doing the first thing that comes to mind. Like if the teacher asks a question in class and I have an answer that comes to mind immediately, um, Inhibition is what helps us uh, stop for a second and remember, okay, I got to raise my hand to be called on. Um, But it also helps us stop for a second and say, hey, is this the answer that I want to give? And it allows for a moment of reflection, of sort of evaluating or um, making a decision about whether there's something else that you haven't factored in yet with that first automatic answer that came to mind. And having the ability to sort of pause for a second before producing a behavior or producing a response um, really helps us kind of stay the course when we are trying to complete a task. Mm -hmm. So there's this kind of holding back component And kind of related to that, another part of this inhibition um, aspect of executive function involves sort of resisting getting distracted as we are executing a plan. So um, if I'm reading in the quiet corner during um, time in class when it's time to read and there is a friend of mine who's sitting nearby who's tapping their pencil on the desk and I can hear tap, 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 tap. being able to resist that kind of distraction and to stay focused on, hey, I'm reading and I'm just going to really, you know, get my um, self oriented just around the reading and not any of these other things coming in. Um, that's a, That's an additional part of that kind of um, inhibition aspect of executive function. And so when we talk about impulsivity um, and when we talk about um, having difficulty with behaviors that are the wrong match for the wrong time, or maybe are taking, um, they're interfering with being able to participate in the um, uh, activities at hand. Um, It can be interpreted as um, having um, a need to strengthen inhibitory control or Mm -hmm. a need to practice those inhibition skills where um, you can uh, uh, know that there's times to, to go with the behavior and there's times to not go with the behavior. And you can kind of um, 
uh, have some kind of control over that. So that's a really important piece. And um, one of the things we've started to talk about in our team, um, as I alluded to before, are what are some of the ways that you can be practicing that in your day-to-day -day life that, you know, are um, not sort of drill exercises or things like that, but that are fun ways. And it turns out a lot of games that we play with young kids have this kind of, are actually yeah. revolve around this go, no go is what it's called. This inhibition of it's time to go, it's time to not go. Um, and so games like red light, green light, um, or like a freeze dance, things like that. Those all, the music's going, the music's going and I'm dancing and then it's time to stop, time to yeah. inhibit. Um, and practicing that actually is kind of fun because um, it's it's such an interesting um, uh, kind of rhythm to be on, to yeah. go and to not go. And then practicing that, you know, there's an idea that maybe the more you do that, the more you're able to tap into that in different parts of your day-to-day -day life. Yeah. Mm. And I think games like that can also work on like another component of executive functioning, which is flexibility. And another part that can be challenging for our guys with Down syndrome is the rule changes or the sudden, you know, needing to, to shift perspectives in so many different areas as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is, again, one of the ones where um, I think we were going to uh, talk a little bit about the sort of developmental changes. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you look at the literature more recently, um, especially, there are some converging findings um, that in general, not every study, but in general, most studies are suggesting that the shifting, that um, cognitive flexibility piece um, is less of an area of um, challenge for younger children mm. um, than working memory or planning. And maybe let me talk for a second about what we're talking about when we say shifting. So. Um, as you described that um, there's another part of executive function that helps us adapt our thinking um, based on changes of uh, different kinds of information coming in that is relevant for us completing our tasks. So um, there can be different rules that we need to use in one condition but or one set of circumstances, but then we shouldn't follow those rules when we're in another set of circumstances or in a different set of conditions. Um, as you mentioned, so recess is a great example when it's playtime during school and there are very specific ways that we um, can behave during recess. We can run around, we can use our outside voice, we mm -hmm. can have high energy levels. Um, and those are sort of the, um, the, the rules or the parameters of what it means to be in recess. Um, but when it's time to come back inside and focus on our math lesson, um, there's a whole different set of rules that we have to tap into. And we have to kind of stop doing the old rules of running around and um, you know, playing outside and tap into a different set of rules that involve lower energy levels, more focus, more quiet, insight voice, things like that. And so being able to be flexible and to shift from one set of parameters to another, from one set of rules to another, um, is really important also for us to be able to um, execute and to be able to um, uh, reach our goals day to day. Which set of rules should I be using right now mm -hmm. to complete this goal or to reach this kind of objective? Um, really, it can vary and to know which ones to use for when is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it's so great because this leads perfectly to the next component that I would love to hear your thoughts on. Um, so many times parents come to us and say, you know, they're great at at school, they'll, they don't have any behavior issues. They're following all the rules, but as soon as they come home, they have a meltdown. And so I, you know, we talk about how they're holding it together all day at school. And then at home, there's issues with emotional and self-regulation. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that component of executive functioning and Down syndrome. So that question is important and has a lot of 
complicated parts to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I'll just talk to uh, speak to a couple of those parts. Yeah. So first of all, it is the case that that transition from being in school to being at home um, is a big one. And even though we do it every day, mm -hmm. um, we know that the types of ways that we interact with our caregivers and the type of um, attunement and responsivity that we respect that we expect from our caregivers um, is different from the ways that our peers or our grown-ups at school, our teachers um, and other support staff might be um, interacting with us. And so we're navigating sort of um, real differences in how we interact with the people around us. Um, and then we're also um, being at, there's a lot being asked of us all day long in school um, related to uh, acquiring new knowledge and um, managing our behavior and reading social cues. Um, and then, uh, like we said before, then going outside and having a playtime and stop doing that. So it's almost as if um, we are really relying on these um, regulatory processes, these processes that help us um, adapt and change and do what we need to do at the right time. Mm -hmm. And it's not surprising that that feels exhausting by the end of the day. And that in combination with coming home to be with your primary um, attachment relationships, your caregivers, your siblings, um, other people, care, caregivers in your, in your home who are your kind of secure base. I'm a developmentalist. I, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll pull it not just from executive research, yeah. but also from some of the early social relatedness research yeah. um, and knowing, um, as I think you um, correctly interpreted, that sometimes um, when you're with your um, primary caregivers and the people who um, are taking care of you and love you um, in that very special way, that there's a sense of security around mm -hmm. knowing that, hey, I just exactly. held it together all day and or I did my very best yeah. and it was hard and I need to express that. Yeah. Um, and so I agree that that is sometimes a very um, important interpretation of seeing that behavior. Um, but it's also important to just even think about the cognitive um, flexibility piece too, that transitions in general, if you have um, difficulty with cognitive flexibility, then just going from one setting to another um, mm -hmm. can require some supports and, and some, um, under, some accommodations um, mm -hmm. and understanding. Um, and I didn't, you know, I, I need to go back just for a second to the previous um, uh, question because I sort of didn't pull the thread all the way through. What we see is that as kids get older and when we go into adolescence and adulthood, that flexibility is becoming more of a challenge for mm -hmm. more people with Down syndrome, that it may be a little less or at least the, um, the ways that um, these challenges um, present themselves may be um, somewhat less interfering yeah, um, or maybe just similar to other um, age match peers in a way that isn't um, uh, unique necessarily um, and notable, but that um, as we get into the teenage years and the adult years, the, the research really does suggest that um, cognitive flexibility uh, becomes more of an area of difficulty for more people. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important thing for us to think about as we talk about sort of pathways to um, employment or inclusive higher education or all kinds of adult outcomes that we hope to promote. Um, practicing being able to be flexible may be a really important factor in helping set people up for success. Yeah, I had a I had a question about that for you, and that was, do, does the research find that there's a decline in the cognitive flexibility as our students with uh, Down syndrome grow through adolescence, or is it a plateau so that they're not keeping pace mm -hmm. with peers? It's such a great question. There, we we don't know enough to say something definitive about that right now, um, because 
um, the research that we have is based on not following the same people over time to mm -hmm. see somebody being, you know, growing, growing, and then maybe losing skills. What we have is data on you know, a bunch of children, a bunch of adolescents and a bunch of adults. Um, sure. And so we get what are called cohort effects. So we can't know, we, uh, the research suggests that when we study teenagers, um, that, that um, the evaluations of flexibility tend to um, involve greater recognition of difficulty. Um, but we don't know if those were all teenagers who had difficulty with this when they were younger too. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. That is really fascinating. Um, I think one way to kind of illustrate what you're talking about is parents and teachers might notice that on days where students don't have to change classrooms several times or do anything unexpected, field trips, special things where we're coming and going and leaving and returning and those kind of things, our students might have a better day mm -hmm. on the days where we do less of that. And we've certainly noticed that when we've been practicing telehealth during the pandemic, some of the students that used to have a really hard time either getting into our session or leaving at the end have had a much easier time because they've been at home. So they've skipped two multifaceted transition. transitions from you know the car to the building to upstairs and all those kind of things have been not part of the picture. And our students have been able to learn more as a result. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. That's re that's a really important insight. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah. So, Dr. Fritter, that was such a great, and I thank you so much for pulling the thread through because I think that's mm -hmm. the important thing that people need to realize is that it's these processes and components don't work in isolation, they work all together and some will work better some days and some won't work better the other days. So it's like this constant, you know, just change from hour to hour, even from day, minute to minute for some of our guys. So it's really important to understand how they all work together. So thank you for providing that picture for us. Um, I just wanted to shift gears a little bit um, before I kind of hand it over to Marla. Like, can you talk a little bit about some of your specific research, especially with regards to how the behavior profile of Down syndrome develops over time? Sure, absolutely. So um, this has been a primary question that our team has been interested in asking for about the past uh, five to seven years. Um, really um, trying to, with the ultimate goal, of um, personalizing and um, improving the planning for early intervention so that we can know as much as possible about what each different child might need based on very early presentation. So um, we've known for quite some time that um, uh, neurodevelopmental or neurogenetic conditions like Down syndrome are associated with different patterns of strength and challenge in adolescence or in middle childhood. But the questions we've been really interested in asking recently have to do with the emergence or the unfolding of those patterns and how they become very in, in very early stages, maybe very subtle um, and not very easy to detect but that um, as we move through early childhood into the middle childhood years um, are becoming more and more pronounced. And can we identify those very early precursors, those very early manifestations mm -hmm. of later more pronounced outcomes um, to take um, what's called a more anticipatory approach to um, education planning, intervention, um, therapies. And, um, and so that's really the big question that we've been after. The, um, the, there are a couple of ways that we've um, tried to answer this. And um, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the infant research that um, we've done recently. And then maybe I'll tell you about the, um, the follow-up we're doing with that infant cohort too, to try to really answer some of those questions more definitively. But with the infants that we um, saw, we, um, uh, we were really curious to, to find out whether or not um, some of these um, very versions of um, what will turn into components of executive function, um, whether we could measure them and describe them and understand them um, in ways that can um, help us uh, 
uh, intervene in really informed ways. And so we examined early aspects of attention mm -hmm. and early aspects of planning in um, infants with Down syndrome for a, a couple of years using direct um, observation laboratory little games that are appropriate for the um, infant age range. And um, what we found was that um, uh, certain aspects of early attention are looking like they're really important for overall learning in general. Mm -hmm. And the type of attention that in particular is really important has to do with executive function, which is um, early attention shifting. Mm -hmm. So um, we know um, in a traditional sense, when we think about we need to help a child pay attention, usually that means to, you know, sustain their attention, keep their attention focused on something for, you know, X amount of time so that they can make it through the lesson or read the whole chapter of the book, et cetera. But there's this other part of attention that has to do with shifting, which is to being, a being able to go from focusing on one thing um, as an infant and to kind of stop focusing on that, especially visually, and then to focus on something else that may be something new that came into your line of view that's really interesting. And it looks as though that ability to disengage, it's called, to stop engaging with one thing and to um, engage with something else is um, correlated from one of the studies that we did with overall cognitive skill learning mm -hmm. in um, infants with Down syndrome. So the faster and the more sort of um, ease an infant could shift their attention around using just a very basic kind of showing things in different parts of the visual field, neat things to look at um, uh, 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 paradigm, that that was, that was the precursor that we studied among all of the other ones that was tracking with overall cognitive skill development. Um, and we also found, this is going back to Emily Shore's work, that if we follow up um, those same infants six months later in that transition to toddlerhood that uh, and give them a very early version of a toddler kind of pre-executive task that involves shifting, it's called the A not B task that um, some people may have heard about, um, that that ability to shift attention also predicts performance on that very early executive task six months later. So these are very beginning pieces of the puzzle that we're trying to put together. Um, and we don't have all of the pieces yet um, by a, a long shot, but we do believe that these, um, these findings are starting to help us um, understand um, that that we really can um, uh, evaluate levels of risk for more pronounced difficulty with mm -hmm. executive function skills. We can um, get in there in the latter part of the first year of development and do some really um, developmentally appropriate, fun, um, social back and forth kinds of um, activities that might be able to strengthen some of those foundations. This is all the, the um, translational part into intervention is very new. Um, and so we don't have a solid empirical base to stand on, but our team did um, complete a, a three week parent mediated um, intervention for um, infants with Down syndrome to promote early goal-directed reaching behavior, mm -hmm. which is an important kind of mm -hmm. earliest kind of plan that we do as infants. And we found that just parents playing with their infants for five to 10 minutes a day for three weeks um, with these different materials and being really um, engaged together socially around it um, uh, made it so that some aspects of reaching behavior happened more readily and that there was less of that wait time, that less of that latency to reach um, out for the object and um, more attempts to reach for objects and things like that. So th these are very small um, uh, uh, 
early steps towards having a much more comprehensive picture for what what we can do um, during early development. But we but they're telling us that um, we think that there's something really here for us to pursue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Yeah, it's fascinating. And it's kind of it's great because it kind of informs our practice as SLPs and OTs that this is something that we can look out for as well, because we do see you know, kids as young as 18 months to one to two. So, and even younger for consultation purposes or whatever, but yeah, very interesting to see the lead up of how attention can impact mm -hmm. later development. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like you were describing essentially the, the little tiny guys ability to notice new things in their environment and then respond to them mm -hmm. instead of continuing to play with or engage with whatever they were already engaging with. So mm -hmm. that's something that parents could maybe look at at home. Like, do they notice when there's a new person in the room or not? And kind of play some fun peek boos and see if they can, you know, enjoy that process. Hmm. That's exactly right. Um, and I think that that key about um, being able to um, have uh, care givers, um, uh, allied health providers, therapists who um, know to look for these subtle things and can just embed them in natural day-to-day -day activities. Mm. Um, you know, not like let's stop and let's go sit and have floor time where we're going to do this you know, exercise for X amount of time, um, but really being able to weave it in um, naturally into interactions can likely be a pretty um, powerful approach as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I completely agree. And, and and I think that OTs and SLPs are really the um, uh, MVPs <laughs> in many ways of um, being able to um, uh, advise and support families in um, these early processes, knowing these very subtle early communicative signals mm -hmm. to, to detect um, and knowing these early motor plans that are are um, shedding light on what the underlying cognitive process is. Mm -hmm. um, and so these things are very subtle, um, but they're very important. And having informed um, experts from those areas who are working with families is just, I think, such an ideal set, uh, setting or mm -hmm. ideal situation. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we love, we love working with the little ones. Yes, um, exactly. And I, I don't know if you agree, Hina, but... I always feel like you can make these tiny changes in early childhood and infancy that have these huge trajectory changes for the well-being yeah. of that person's life going forward. And yeah. it's, it's small. It's really small stuff when they're, when they're young. Yeah. Yeah. And I find that it's, um, I'm a big proponent as an OT for sure of like starting independence as early as possible. So I think this is one of those things where I think the, the tricky thing is just getting parents this this on parents radar because they have so many other things to think about mm -hmm. especially if you have a child with down syndrome but just giving them like even just that attention shifting attention thing you know that's some simple little thing that they can work on even when their kids are little babies right so it's mm -hmm. it gives them it arms them with a little bit of information and then they can kind of run with it and see so yeah i agree marla it's a uh, the littlest things can make a big impact for sure mm -hmm. That piece that you mentioned is really important too. Um, as we think about developing new techniques, one of the most important things that we're doing is we're talking to parents first mm -hmm. and we're having focus groups and more informal conversations so that we have the, the end user, the person who's going to actually be doing these activities yeah informing us from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. What is feasible? What is something that feels like, you know, you know, that's a nice idea, but we're never going to do it. Or what is something that, um, hey, I know I can put that routine into bath time yeah. every night. That's not mm -hmm. a problem. Um, you know, we're already going to be getting dressed anyway. And so why don't we add this little fun routine in there? Um, and so really understanding what motivates families when they're seeking new strategies um, and what their goals are for their um, their child um, and um, and then what is what are the ways that are the most um, acceptable um, that are things that families will actually not just 
not, you know, tolerate, but like doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and, and if we have that in mind from the beginning, um, we think that the, um, we even, you know, even if our techniques are going to be a little effective, they might be way more effective if um, there's greater um, buy-in and motivation because families feel like it's something fun to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, I, I completely agree with you is what I would have to say about that. And we try and steer clear of overhauling. You know, parents mm-hmm. are already doing a lot of things and 99% of it is going to be what we would tell them to do anyway. So it's all about these little tiny tweaks to add in a little bit more of something without, you know, taking three hours of their day because nobody has that time. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly yeah. right. Um, I wanted to pivot here a little bit. You alluded to something in the very, very beginning when you were talking about how there might be some subgrouping um, in sort of within the overall population of people who have Down syndrome. Um, and so I was wondering whether that is aligned with sort of some of the additional diagnoses that we might see or might apply later for people with Down syndrome. So I'm thinking about things like ASD diagnosis and ADHD diagnosis. Um, Do we notice profile differences when we see additional diagnoses? The question about understanding whether or not there are um, potentially subgroups and whether or not co-occurring diagnoses may impact executive function is a question that we don't have definitive answers to yet, but we may be able to um, uh, have some answers very soon with some of the research that we're conducting right now. Um, in particular, with respect to um, uh, ADHD and understanding how um, ADHD symptoms may be related to executive function performance. Um, we think it's um, something that we can really um, describe pretty carefully in this cohort that we have been studying first as infants, and now we're going to see them again as four to five-year-olds. We're evaluating their executive function, and we're also um, asking for um, caregiver report of ADHD symptomatology across a few different measures. Um, And so we know what we hypothesize may be the case, um, and we can take um, what we know from the literature in um, ADHD in the general population and um, speculate a little bit. Um, The speculation is that we may see some greater difficulty in aspects of inhibition when we see um, co-occurring Down syndrome and ADHD. Um, And so it may be the case that some of the um, impulsivity that's associated with ADHD um, is also um, manifesting in terms of difficulty with those kinds of go, no go processes um, of inhibitory control and resisting distractors, things like that, um, that we were talking about earlier in the podcast. Um, So I think that, um, that's, that's speculation right now. We cannot answer that definitively. And one thing that's really important, there is a paper that did just come out that talks about um, how there's some overlap in terms of inattention or difficulty with focusing um, among people who have Down syndrome only and people who have Down syndrome and ADHD together. And so it may not be as simple as um, difficulty focusing and attention um, is what um, the presence of ADHD is. It it looks a little bit more complex than that. Um, But one thing is for sure um, that we will be looking to see whether or not there are um, aspects of executive function that um, can help us understand ADHD symptoms or can we can understand what's linked to ADHD symptoms um, um, through the data that we are collecting right now. Um, In terms of co-occurring Down syndrome and ASD, autism spectrum disorder, again, we don't have data yet 
to really know that. Um, but what we could hypothesize would be that we might see greater difficulties in the area of um, cognitive flexibility. So um, we know that autism um, has uh, two different um, areas to it. Um, there's the um, social communication um, challenges, but there's also um, restricted uh, narrow interests and repetitive behaviors. And one way of thinking about those sort of um, narrow repetitive um, interests and behaviors might be difficulty with shifting away or being more flexible in your thinking and being really sort of focused in one direction on maybe one topic area and not being able to adapt and flexibly move away to a different topic area. So um, it may be the case that when we see co-occurring Down syndrome and autism spectrum disorder, that that aspect of executive function um, looks different in that subgroup. I have to say it doesn't come as a surprise, but it'll be very yeah. interesting to see how the how the research pans out. And I would be interested to see as well whether the increased gaze latency or the longer time that it takes little babies to notice and respond to something new, if that will correlate with mm -hmm. an additional diagnosis later, obviously in a form of some kind of spectrum, because it's not a yes, no, but it is, it's fascinating research. I can't wait to see with what you guys uncover there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I recognize that parents might be listening to this and cringing a tiny bit thinking, oh no, more things we have to do now. Um, so what can parents and caregivers and even educators do sort of within their day to day to help improve or really strengthen those emerging skills of executive functioning for people with Down syndrome? Well, that is exactly the question that we are working on right now. We just started a new project um, where we're aiming to develop um, new parent um, activities, parent-child activities for um, preschoolers with Down syndrome and their parents to do together that will practice these different aspects of executive function skills. Um, what we, so right now there aren't uh, strategies that have been tested um, through research, but there are um, informed strategies based on um, what we know about development in people with Down syndrome and what we know about executive function intervention in general. Um, so one of the ideas in um, terms of working memory is to really do some of the practicing um, that we described a little bit earlier in the podcast, um, you know, it's time to get in the car to go to school. First, let's get your coat, then let's get your bag, and then let's get in the car. And really narrating that, like, remember, we are first getting your coat, then we're getting your bag, and then we're getting in the car, modeling those kinds of holding on to the information um, and maybe with some prompting throughout, but taking the prompts away once they don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so finding ways where you're using those skills and make it kind of very overt, um, but not in a way that stops everything and says, we're going to work on working memory right now. But that's just a little thing that we do every time we go and get in the car to go to the grocery store or go to school. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with, uh, it can be during a um, uh, bedtime routine, right? Um, uh, we're going to say goodnight to um, first the bear, Mr. Bear, and then we're gonna say goodnight to the frog, and then we're gonna put our head on our pillow and just even practice sort of remember, okay, who came first? Who do we hug first? First, we're gonna hug Mr. Bear, and then we're gonna hug the frog, and then we're gonna put our head on the pillow. Um, just little moments like that. Um, and, you know, um, it might at the beginning um, involve, for a younger child um, or a child who needs more practice with working memory, um, prompting all the way through. But it might just be, see if you can remember, who did I hug first? Yeah. Who did I hug next? And then just, you know, holding, um, holding back. So um, just tiny little games, not involving going out and getting all kinds of fancy materials, not involving, um, you know, uh, some kind of very complex technique where, 
um, parents have to study um, all kinds of nuances of um, uh, a, a larger technique or anything like that, but just fun little moments that you can create with your child that tap into these skills um, and that just give a little bit of practice pretty regularly throughout the day. Um, same thing with, um, okay, we're gonna, time to sort the laundry. Okay, we're gonna put all of the shirts here and then we're gonna put all of the uh, socks here and then, you know, have just a, um, a rule to follow. Okay, we're gonna play a silly game now. I'm gonna put this sock in the shirt pile and I'm gonna put this shirt in the sock pile. Okay, you do it. And just a fun moment, just, you know, in the middle of uh, folding laundry and practice being able to, you know, have flexibility and switch a rule back and forward. Mm -hmm. um, so those kinds of ideas, that's what we're in a um, idea development and uh, intervention development phase right now um, with our team. We're meeting each week and um, we're doing these focus groups and things like that. Um, and the hope is, is that what we'll have at the end will be something that is uh very doable. That is not, mm -hmm. it, it's always an ask to ask parents to add more to their routines, always. Um, but we're hoping that these things will be enjoyable and not, um, not a overly burdensome, as you mentioned before, and most of all, um, really helpful. Mm -hmm. I like that. One of my favorite things to do is like, once you get the routine somewhat set, I also like sometimes like to, and I hesitate hesitate to say test because I don't want parents testing kids, <laughs> but it's more just like, oh, like, what do we need next? When we're making a peanut butter sandwich, hmm, what do we put the food in? So even allowing them to problem solve a little bit that way, I find sometimes can promote that independence in doing mm -hmm. it. So yeah. Yes. Along those lines, you can do, um, let's say it's dinner time and people are just, you know, taking turns talking about something from the day. Okay. Whose turn is who went already? Who hasn't gone yet? Whose yeah. turn is it? Yeah. Yeah. And just remembering, updating where you are in the conversation, things like that. Mm -hmm. And hopefully parents upon hearing this kind of thing are feeling a little bit better thinking, oh, I actually do some of that. And now I'm recognizing that, you know, not only is it fun and what we do anyway, but I'm helping my kid in a way that just goes with the flow of our family life, right? It doesn't always have to be something extra or different. Well, that's really, yeah, I'm glad you illustrated those ideas. Um, lastly, did you have any particular resources that you would like to recommend to the people who listen here? It's a great question. Um, you know what, I would say there are some surprising things that parents can do um, with their kids to practice executive function. Um, one of the recommendations that's out there has to do with um, doing some mindfulness mm -hmm. activities. We don't know if this applies to lots of different um subgroups of people, but there is um, some evidence in the general literature that practicing little um, uh, aspects of mindfulness um, can be helpful for some people to develop greater um, executive function skills. Um, there are some activities that have been shown to um, facilitate executive function skills like um, playing board games or doing karate um, and um, other different types of really engaging activities, um, but that, um, you know, we don't set out to practice our executive function skills when we sit down to play Monopoly um, or some other um, fun yeah. game, um, but we might actually be strengthening those skills without even focusing on it. Um, mm -hmm. So, there are um, some neat um, articles that are out there and I'm happy to um, forward some, some of those resources along um, where you might find that you're practicing these executive skills in unexpected places. Mm -hmm. mm. I love what you said about karate. I wouldn't usually think about karate, but I would think about like dance or something else where you're remembering a lot of steps and you're starting and stopping with the group, but karate is the same way for a whole group of kids who would prefer to do something like that. That's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. That's a lot yeah. of organized sports when I you know, <laughs> come to realize it, especially where you're going to, you know, soccer practice. Okay. Everybody go, everybody stop, everybody kick the ball now. 
like a lot of that is a lot of fun for kids and good participation too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, exactly right. Fiddler, we we hugely appreciate our chat with you today. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Lowdown. It was a pleasure. It's been such a pleasure. I really enjoyed speaking with both of you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Fiddler. Thank you.